Section 4 of The Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Antwerp, 4th October, 1641. We sailed by several Spanish forts, out of one of which St. Mary's Port came a don on board us, to whom I showed my Spanish pass, which he signed and civilly dismissed us. Hence, sailing by another man of war, to which we lowered our topsails, we at length arrived at Antwerp. The lodgings here are very handsome and convenient. I lost little time, but with the aid of one Mr. Luchner, our conductor, we visited diverse churches, colleges and monasteries. The church of the Jesuits is most sumptuous and magnificent, a glorious fabric without and within, wholly encrusted with marble, inlaid and polished into diverse representations of histories, landscapes and flowers. On the high altar is placed the statue of the Blessed Virgin and our Saviour in white marble, with a boss in the girdle set with very fair and rich sapphires and divers other stones of price. The choir is a glorious piece of architecture, the pulpit supported by four angels and adorned with other carvings, and rare pictures by Rubens, now lately dead, and divers votive tables and relics. Hence to the Vrouw Kirk, or Notre Dame of Antwerp, it is a very venerable fabric, built after the Gothic manner, especially the tower, which I ascended, the better to take a view of the country adjacent, which, happening on a day when the sun shone exceedingly bright, and darted his rays without any interruption, afforded so bright a reflection to us who were above, and had a full prospect of both land and water about it, that I was much confirmed in my opinion of the moon's being of some such substance as this earthly globe. Perceiving all the subjacent country at so small and horizontal distance, to repercuss such a light as I could hardly look against, save where the river and other large water within our view appeared of a more dark and uniform colour, resembling those spots in the moon supposed to be seas there, according to Hervelius, and as they appear in our late telescopes. I numbered in this church thirty privileged daughters, that of St. Sebastian adorned with a painting of his martyrdom. We went to see the Jerusalem church, affirmed to have been founded by one who upon divers great wages passed to and fro between that city and Antwerp on foot, by which he procured large sums of money which he bestowed on this pious structure. Hence to St. Mary's Chapel, where I had some conference with two English Jesuits, confessors to Colonel Jay's regiment. These fathers conducted us to the cloister of nuns, where we heard a Dutch sermon upon the exposure of the host. The Senate House of this city is a very spacious and magnificent building. 5th October 1641 I visited the Jesuit school, which for the fame of their method I greatly desired to see. They were divided into four classes, with several inscriptions over each, as first, Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam, over the second, Princeps Diligentiae, the third, Imperator Byzantiorum, over the fourth and uppermost, Imperator Romanorum. Under these, the scholars and pupils and their places or forms with titles and priority according to their proficiency. Their dormitory and lodgings above were exceedingly neat. They have a prison for the offenders and less diligent, and in an ample court to recreate themselves in is an aviary and a yard, where eagles, vultures, foxes, monkeys and other animals are kept, to divert the boys with all at their hours of remission. To this school join the music and mathematical schools, and lastly a pretty neat chapel. The great street is built after the Italian mode, in the middle whereof is erected a glorious crucifix of white and black marble, greater than the life. This is a very fair and noble street, clean, well paved and sweet to admiration. 
The Erster's house, belonging to the East India Company, is a stately palace adorned with more than 300 windows. From hence, walking into the gun garden, I was allowed to see as much of the citadel as is permitted to strangers. It is a matchless piece of modern fortification, accommodated with lodgements for the soldiers and magazines. The graphs, ramparts and platforms are stupendous. Returning by the shop of Plantin, I bought some books, for the namesake only of that famous printer. But there was nothing about this city which more ravished me than those delicious shades and walks of stately trees, which render the fortified works of the town one of the sweetest places in Europe. Nor did I ever observe a more quiet, clean, elegantly built and civil place than this magnificent and famous city of Antwerp. In the evening I was invited to Signor Duertes, a Portuguese by nation, an exceeding rich merchant whose palace I found to be furnished like a prince's. His three daughters entertained us with rare music, vocal and instrumental, which was finished with a handsome collation. I took leave of the ladies and of sweet Antwerp, as late as it was, embarking for Brussels on the Scheldt in a vessel which delivered us to a second boat, in another river, drawn or towed by horses. In this passage we frequently changed our barge by reason of the bridges thwarting our course. Here I observed numerous families inhabiting their vessels and floating dwellings, so built and divided by cabins as few houses on land enjoy better accommodation, stored with all sorts of utensils, neat chambers, a pretty parlour, and kept so sweet that nothing could be more refreshing. The rivers on which they are drawn are very clear and still waters, and pass through a most pleasant country on both the banks. We had in our boat a very good ordinary and excellent company. The cut is straight as a line for twenty English miles. What I much admired was near the midway another artificial river which intersects this at right angles, but on an eminence of ground and is carried in an aqueduct of stone so far above the other as that the waters neither mingle nor hinder one another's passage. We came to a town called Villfrau, where all the passengers went on shore to wash at a fountain issuing out of a pillar, and then came aboard again. On the margin of this long tract are abundance of shrines and images, defended from the injuries of the weather by niches of stone, wherein they are placed. Brussels, 7th October 1641 We arrived at Brussels at nine in the morning. The Stadthaus, near the marketplace, is for the carving in freestone a most laborious and finished piece, well worthy observation. The flesh shambles are also built of stone. I was pleased with certain small engines by which a girl or boy was able to draw up or let down great bridges, which in diverse parts of this city cross the channel for the benefit of passengers. The walls of this town are very entire and full of towers at competent distances. The cathedral is built upon a very high and exceeding steep ascent, to which we mounted by fair steps of stone. Hence I walked to a convent of English nuns, with whom I sat discoursing most part of the afternoon. 8th October 1641 Being the morning I came away, I went to see the Prince's Court, an ancient, confused building, not much unlike the Hoft at the Hague. There is here likewise a very large hall where they vend all sorts of wares. Through this we passed by the chapel, which is indeed rarely arched, and in the middle of it was the hearse or catafalque of the late Archduchess, the wise and pious Clara Eugenia. Out of this we were conducted to the lodgings, tapestried with incomparable arras, and adorned with many excellent pieces of Rubens, old and young Bruegel, Titian and Stenwick, with stories of most of the late actions in the Netherlands. By an accident we could not see the library. 
There is a fair terrace which looks to the vineyard in which on pedestals are fixed the statues of all the Spanish kings of the House of Austria. The opposite walls are painted by Rubens, being a history of the late tumults in Belgia. In the last piece, the Archduchess shuts a great pair of gates upon Mars, who is coming out of hell armed and in a menacing posture, which, with that other of the Infanta taking leave of Don Philip the Fourth, is a most incomparable table. From hence we walked into the park, which for being entirely within the walls of the city is particularly remarkable, nor is it less pleasant than if in the most solitary recesses, so naturally is it furnished, with whatever may render it agreeable, melancholy and country-like. Here is a stately heronry, diverse springs of water, artificial cascades, rocks, grots, one whereof is composed of the extravagant roots of trees, cunningly built and hung together with wires. In this park are both fallow and red deer. From hence we were led into the menage, and out of that into a most sweet and delicious garden, where was another grot of more neat and costly materials, full of noble statues, and entertaining us with artificial music. But the hedge of water, in form of lattice work, which the fountaineer caused to ascend out of the earth by degrees, exceedingly pleased and surprised me. For thus, with a pervious wall, or rather a palisade hedge of water, was the whole parterre environed. There is likewise a fair aviary, and in the court next it are kept diverse sorts of animals, rare and exotic fowl, as eagles, cranes, storks, bustards, pheasants of several kinds, and a duck having four wings. In another division of the same close are rabbits of an almost perfect yellow colour. There was no court now in the palace, the Infante Cardinal, who was the governor of Flanders, being dead, but newly, and every one in deep mourning. At near eleven o'clock I repaired to His Majesty's agent, Sir Henry de Vick, who very courteously received me and accommodated me with a coach and six horses which carried me from Brussels to Ghent, where it was to meet my Lord of Arundel, Earl Marshal of England, who had requested me when I was at Antwerp to send it for him if I went not thither myself. Thus taking leave of Brussels and a sad court, yet full of gallant persons, for in this small city the acquaintance being universal, ladies and gentlemen, I had perceived had great diversions and frequent meetings, I hastened towards Ghent. On the way I met with diverse little wagons, prettily contrived and full of peddling merchandise, drawn by mastiff dogs, harnessed completely like so many coach horses in some four, in others six, as in Brussels itself I had observed. In Antwerp I saw, as I remember, four dogs draw five lusty children in a chariot. The master commands them whither he pleases, crying his wares about the streets. After passing through Auza by six in the evening, I arrived at Ghent. This is a city of so great a circumference that it is reported to be seven leagues round, but there is not half of it now built, much of it remaining in fields and desolate pastures, even within the walls, which have strong gates towards the west, and two fair churches. Here I beheld the palace wherein John of Gaunt and Charles V were born, whose statue stands in the market-place upon a high pillar with his sword drawn, to which, as I was told, the magistrates and burghers were wont to repair upon a certain day every year with ropes about their necks, in token of submission and penance for an old rebellion of theirs. But now the hemp is changed into a blue ribbon. Here is planted the basilisco, or great gun, so much talked of. The lease and the Scheldt, meeting in this vast city, divided into twenty-six islands, which are united by many bridges, somewhat resembling Venice. This night I supped with the abbot of Andoyne, a pleasant and courteous priest. 8th October 1641 I passed by boat to Bruges, 
taking in at a redoubt a convoy of fourteen musketeers because the other side of the river, being contribution land, was subject to the inroads and depredations of the bordering states. This river was cut by the famous Marquis Spinola, and is in my judgment a wonderful piece of labour and a worthy public work, being in some places forced through the main rock to an incredible depth for thirty miles. At the end of each mile is built a small redoubt which communicates a line to the next, and so the whole way from whence we receive many volleys of shot, in compliment to my Lord Marshal, who was in our vessel a passenger with us. At five that evening we were met by the magistrates of Bruges who came out to convey my lord to his lodgings, at whose cost he was entertained that night. The morning after we went to see the Stadthaus and adjoining aqueduct, the church and market place, where we saw cheeses and butter piled up in heaps, also the fortifications and grafts which are extremely large. The ninth we arrived at Ostend by a straight and artificial river. Here, with leave of the captain of the watch, I was carried to survey the river and harbour, with fortifications on one side thereof. The east and south are mud and earth walls. It is a very strong place, and lately stood a memorable siege, three years, three months, three weeks, and three days. I went to see the church of St. Peter and the cloisters of the Franciscans. 10th October 1641. I went by wagon, accompanied with a jovial commissary, to Dunkirk, the journey being made all on the sea sands. On our arrival, we first viewed the court of guards, the works, the townhouse, and the new church. The latter is very beautiful within, and another, wherein they showed us an excellent piece of our Saviour's bearing the cross. The harbour, in two channels, coming up to the town, was choked with a multitude of prizes. From hence the next day I marched three English miles towards the packet boat, being a pretty frigate of six guns, which embarked us for England about three in the afternoon. Dover At our going off, the fort, against which our pinnace anchored, saluted my Lord Marshal with twelve great guns, which we answered with three. Not having the wind favourable, we anchored that night before Calais. About midnight we weighed, and at four in the morning, though not far from Dover, we could not make the pier till four that afternoon, the wind proving contrary and driving us westward. But at last we got on shore, October the twelfth. From Dover, I that night rode post to Canterbury. Here I visited the cathedral, then in great splendour, those famous windows being entire, since demolished by the fanatics. The next morning, by Sittingbourne, I came to Rochester, and thence to Gravesend, where a light horseman, as they call it, taking us in, we spent our tide as far as Greenwich. From hence, after we had a little refreshed ourselves at the college, for by reason of contagion then in London we bought the inns, we came to London landing at Arundel Stairs. Here I took leave of his lordship and retired to my lodgings in the Middle Temple, being about two in the morning, the 14th of October. 16th of October, 1641. I went to see my brother at Watton, on the 31st of that month, unfortunate for the Irish rebellion which broke out on the 23rd, I was one and twenty years of age. 7th November 1641. After receiving the sacrament at Watton Church, I visited my Lord Marshal at Albury. 23rd November 1641. I returned to London, and on the 25th saw His Majesty ride through the city after his coming out of Scotland, and a peace proclaimed with great acclamations and joy of the giddy people. 15th December 1641 I was elected one of the controllers of the Middle Temple Revellers, as the fashion of the young students and gentlemen was, the Christmas being kept this year with great solemnity 
but being desirous to pass it in the country, I got leave to resign my staff of office and went with my brother Richard to Watton. 10th January 1642. I gave a visit to my cousin Hatton of Ditton. 19th January 1642. I went to London, where I stayed till 5th of March, studying a little, but dancing and fooling more. 3rd October 1642. To Chichester, and hence the next day, to see the siege of Portsmouth. For now was that bloody difference between the King and Parliament broken out, which ended in the fatal tragedy so many years after. It was on the day of its being rendered to Sir William Waller, which gave me an opportunity of taking my leave of Colonel Goring, the Governor, now embarking for France. This day was fought that signal battle at Age Hill. Thence I went to Southampton and Winchester, where I visited the castle, school, church, and King Arthur's round table, but especially the church and its Saxon king's monuments, which I esteemed a worthy antiquity. The 12th of November was the Battle of Brentford, surprisingly fought, and to the great consternation of the city, had His Majesty, as it was believed he would, pursued his advantage. I came in with my horse and arms just at the retreat, but was not permitted to stay longer than the 15th, by reason of the army marching to Gloucester, which would have left both me and my brothers exposed to ruin without any advantage to His Majesty. End of section 4